What's up everybody? In this video, I'm going to be teaching you everything that you need to know about breast pathology. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. If you want to support my mission to provide free quality medical education, please consider clicking the join button, which you can find as the first link in the description of any video on my channel, as well as beneath any video on my channel. If you click that join button, you'll sign up to be a Dirty Medicine member where you pay $4.99 a month to support my channel financially. I thank you very much for your consideration. Now, when it comes to breast pathology, medical students freak out because there's a lot of different tumors, a lot of different cancers, a lot of different conditions. They all sound alike. They all involve the breast. And for a lot of people, keeping all these things straight, memorizing buzzwords, recognizing histology in pictures is just very difficult. So I want to try to simplify this topic to put your mind at ease so that when you go into USMLE and Comlex, you're feeling prepared to pick up some extra free points. Now, of course, throughout this video, I'm going to give you some really easy mnemonics to help conceptualize all of this and help with your recall. So before I get started, I just want to say that the purpose of this video is not to teach you pathophysiology. The purpose of this video is to give you tools to answer questions and pick up points. All right, so let's get right into this. Before we get started, I just want to give you a conceptualization of breast pathology and like how your brain should organize this. When it comes to breast pathology, you want to separate it into one of three different categories. We have inflammatory conditions, we have benign conditions, and we have malignant conditions. We're going to go through each of these diseases one at a time, but let me just give you the overview. In the inflammatory conditions, we're going to talk about mastitis, mammary duct ectasia, and fat necrosis of the breast. For benign conditions, we're going to talk about fibrocystic changes, intraductal papillomas, fibroadenomas, and the Philodes tumor. And then for the malignant conditions, we'll talk about ductal carcinoma in situ, invasive ductal carcinoma, lobular carcinoma in situ, and invasive lobular carcinoma. So each of these three categories represents a distinct grouping of pathology. And we'll start with the inflammatory conditions and then just work our way down and then across to the right. So with that said, let's just jump right in. We're gonna start by talking about mastitis. So mastitis refers to inflammation of the breast parenchyma. And you can see in this picture that you just get inflammation around the breast. So I like to keep things stupid and simple. Anytime you see itis, it's referring to inflammation, swelling, redness, etc. So this itis is occurring in the mast or in the breast region. And this is most commonly due to staph aureus. And how this works is that a young mother will be breastfeeding and as she's doing that with repeated breastfeeding, you get the formation of these little fissures on the breast. And those little fissures are kind of like cracks in the skin. And they give the staph aureus a route of entry into the breast. And if that staph aureus enters into the breast, it can cause localized infection, hence the name acute mastitis. Now, in addition to breastfeeding and staph aureus entry into the fissures, the other way that you can get formation of bacteria within the breast is due to insufficient milk drainage. So when a, a new mother is producing milk, she either needs to breastfeed at a certain frequency or pump at a certain frequency, which is literally like putting a suction cup on the breast and sort of sucking the milk out because the milk has to be relieved from the breast or else the milk will build up and back up and sort of clog that system. When you've got a lot of high nutrient milk clogging up the breast, causing inflammation in the breast itself, that's really just a nidus for bacteria. So bacteria will feed off of those nutrients, go to that area where the milk gets clogged up and backed up, and you can also get mastitis that way. So on USMLE and Comlex, what you want to look for in the vignette is a, a mother that's breastfeeding that has a warm, swollen, tender breast. And that could be either due to the entry through the fissures, or it could be the same presentation with a mother that they might say in the vignette, like fell asleep for a prolonged period of time, et cetera. They're giving you clues that maybe mom forgot to pump, maybe mom forgot to breastfeed. So that's mastitis. Now, when it comes to treating mastitis, you use dicloxacillin, analgesics, and compresses. Now, very high yield for step two, level two, and step three, level three, is they're going to give you mastitis and they're going to ask what mom should do. And the answer is continue to breastfeed. So even though it's going to be very painful because the breast is swollen, mom should continue to breastfeed. And that's a very high yield point 
for step two, level two, and beyond. So that's mastitis. Again, itis meaning inflammation, inflammation of the breast. We talked about how it works, how the bacteria enters, and what the treatment is. Don't really need a mnemonic here because this is the only condition with itis. So this is the one that's inflammation of the breast. Now let's talk about mammary duct ectasia. So mammary duct ectasia refers to subareolar periductal inflammation with dilated mammary ducts. The classic symptom that you see here is greenish, brownish nipple discharge. Occasionally it can be bloody, but to make the question stem non-controversial, usually the test writer will use this buzzword. So it's going to be green, brown nipple discharge. If you see that, you want to immediately think mammary duct ectasia because that's the giveaway. Now this always can this also can present as a periareolar mass. Now when you see mammary duct ectasia, they could describe what's known as an inverted nipple. And you can Google that if you want to see what that looks like. This is thought to be due, mammary duct ectasia, to endoluminal changes in the lactiferous system of the breast that are associated with aging. So as such, you usually see mammary duct ectasia in like 40 to 50-ish year olds, possibly postmenopausal. And again, because these are due to changes that are associated with aging, that endoluminal system changes and that leads to this periductal inflammation and you get that classic dilation of the mammary ducts. Now again, if you're sort of like, well, what am I supposed to take out of this? How will I pick this in a question? Green brown nipple discharge is, is the high yield buzzword that you wanna know. So with that said, my mnemonic to remember this is that you, need a, you obviously need a way to know green brown nipple discharge. So when I think of mammary duct ectasia, I actually think of mammary duck ectasia. And for me, as a huge sports fan, I'm sorry if you're not a sports fan, this might be a little bit more challenging for you, uh, I think of the Oregon Ducks. And their logo tells me a couple things. One, that greenish, bronzish, brownish, orangish color. I mean, green is their main color, but secondarily, they've got that orange um, that green orange green brown if you will that color is the color of the discharge So I always keep that in mind because mammary duck ectasia reminds me of the colors of the Oregon duck The other thing is that the the bill of this duck up top I always think of that as being inverted which reminds me that if I see the word inverted nipple in the vignette I should also think of my mammary duck ectasia So the Oregon duck tells you a lot here it gives you the colors of the discharge and if you think about its upper bill being inverted it reminds you of an inverted nipple. So again, if you're not a sports fan, you've never seen this logo before, pick a different duck. I don't know if other ducks have this color, but this mnemonic worked really well for me. Now we'll talk about fat necrosis of the breast. Fat necrosis of the breast actually isn't that complicated, but it's a test favorite because there are a lot of buzzwords that they can give you if they want you to pick fat necrosis of the breast. So basically, fat necrosis of the breast refers to non-viable adipo adipose tissue that gets replaced by scar tissue. So basically, something happens to the tissue in the breast which renders that adipose tissue non-viable or dead, if you will. And then our bodies just replace that with scar tissue, which is sort of like a normal process in scar formation. The only problem here is that it's happening in the breast, and because it's happening in the breast, and that's a very unique area of tissue, you get these classic fat necrosis changes. So what you'll see under the microscope is multinucleated giant cells with aberrant calcifications. So those are buzzwords that you wanna know for sure. This is most commonly associated with one of two things. And this is where USMLE or Comlex is gonna go. They're gonna give you a woman that experienced a mechanical trauma to the breast. So some force was directed at the breast, which basically killed that adipose tissue and then the body just replaced it with scar tissue. And in replacing it, now you see those giant cells, those calcifications. You can see what might mimic a malignancy because you can get the formation of a little mass there where that scar tissue is being formed, but it's just fat necrosis. It's not breast cancer. Um, so it's either going to be mechanical trauma or the test will give you someone that recently underwent breast surgery. And it was that local surgery ba basically rendering that adipose tissue non-viable that then caused fat necrosis to take place. So you want to think trauma or recent surgery causing this fat necrosis, which mimics malignancy, but is not malignancy. So big picture here is you need to know what's happening and what the buzzwords are, because like I said, there are a lot of buzzwords that they can put in the vignette if they want you to pick fat necrosis. So we need a mnemonic. 
And when I think of fat necrosis of the breast, obviously I'm thinking fat. What has a lot of fat? Cheese. And here you see a couple things. You see a giant block of cheese that's full of calcium and that recently was cut with a knife. What does this tell you? Well, it's a giant block of cheese, so it should remind you of multinucleated giant cells. It's full of calcium, so that should tell you about the calcifications that you'll see in fat necrosis of the breast. And it being recently cut by a knife reminds me of either recently being cut with breast surgery or recently experiencing mechanical trauma. So fat necrosis of the breast, what has a lot of fat? Cheese. Giant block of cheese that's full of calcium that was recently cut. Done. All right, so that's all the inflammatory conditions. I flew through that. This is sort of rapid review, but again, I'm giving you ways to conceptualize, understand, and use mnemonics to memorize what you need to know to pick out these, these answers on USMLE and Comlex. So now let's switch gears and talk about the benign breast pathology. We're going to begin with fibrocystic change, also known as fibrocystic disease of the breast. Now this is the most common benign breast pathology in this entire section. So if you're taking step two level two or step three level three, you wanna know that because that could show up as an epidemiology type question. So when we talk about fibrocystic changes, this refers, as the name implies, to benign fibrosis and cyst tissue formation. Look at the name guys, it's fibrocystic. Fibro means fibrosis, cystic means cyst. So fibrocysts, fibrocystic changes occurring in the breast. This is an umbrella term, which refers to benign changes that occur in lots of different ways within the breast. This usually occurs in premenopausal women. So you're thinking people like 20 to 50 years old, roughly. And this is likely hormone mediated. So you want to know that premenopausal and hormone mediated. When it comes to taking or memorizing information about different types of tumors and cancers, one of the ways that you can make a really educated guess is if you know the average age range, because some cancers only occur in postmenopausal and your elderly folks, others occur in premenopausal and your younger folks. So if you knew that and literally nothing else, you could make a very educated guess by eliminating possible answer choices. So for fibrocystic change, know that it's premenopausal and hormone mediated. Now, what's really important to know about fibrocystic changes are these different subtypes, because depending on what type of subtype of fibrocystic change, which again, recall that that's an umbrella term that refers to a lot of different histopathological changes that occur in the breast, but depending on which subtype we're talking about, there's a varying degree of risk of the progression or the formation of cancer. So there are three different subtypes, and I'm trying to really keep this simple. And the way that you should go about this is memorize that one is called apocrine metaplasia, one is called sclerosing adenosis, and one is called atypical hyperplasia. It's not important to know what those look like under a microscope. I don't really think you need to know any other buzzwords of histopathology that are associated with them, but you do need to know the names of these subtypes and the degree of risk that they pose. Now I have a mnemonic here and I'll get into that in just one second, but let me just read the normal first. So apocrine metaplasia has no risk of cancer formation. Sclerosing adenosis has what they say some risk. So they estimate that it's roughly um, two times the risk. And then for atypical hyperplasia, there's very significant risk, at least five times the risk. So apocrine, no risk. Sclerosing, some risk. Atypical, significant risk. My mnemonic to remember this, because this is very important, very high yield, is APOK, Sclerosing equals sum, and atypical is likely to a turn into cancer. So for apocrine, apo makes me think of your AOK because there's no risk. So instead of saying AOK, I say your apok. So apocrine, you're okay. So there's no risk. Sclerosing equals sum. So I just match those S's, and then atypical can a turn into cancer. So the AT in atypical is likely to a turn. AT in a turn into cancer because again with atypical hyperplasia of fibrocystic changes there's that roughly five times increased risk so if you see this on a test and they say or describe apocrine metaplasia they say or describe sclerosing adenosis they say or describe atypical hyperplasia you need to know the risk associated with that so it's very important to understand so big picture here guys fibrocystic changes fibrocystic it's fibrosis and cysts premenopausal women 
hormone mediated. Generally speaking, it's benign unless you have either sclerosing, so some risk, or a typical can a turn into cancer. If you're apocrine, you're apok. -okay. Done. Let's move on. Now we're going to talk about intraductal papilloma. An intraductal papilloma refers to papillary growth within the epithelial cells of a large duct. So as the name implies, it's intraductal. It's in the large duct. Now the way that this is going to present on USMLE and Comlex is going to be somebody with bloody nipple discharge. It's likely going to be a premenopausal woman. And then they're going to give you some histopathology and they're going to use the term fibrovascular projections. The reason that this is a really tough question on USMLE and Comlex is because intraductal papilloma is extremely similar in presentation and in histopathology to something known as papillary carcinoma. Both intraductal papilloma and papillary carcinoma have bloody nipple discharge as the clinical symptom and fibrovascular projections as the histopathology. So if you're given a question and the patient has bloody nipple discharge and fibrovascular projections lined by epithelial cells, right now you don't know which of the two diagnoses you're dealing with. So how do you get this right? You have to look in the question and see or look at the image that they give you if they're going to be really tricky and see is there an underlying myoepithelium. And if there is, it's intraductal papilloma. But if there isn't, it's papillary carcinoma. So bottom line here is that both intraductal papilloma and papillary carcinoma will present with bloody nipple discharge and the histology will either be described as or show in the image fibrovascular projections lined by epithelial cells. If there's a present myoepithelium, it's intraductal papilloma and that is more of a benign picture. And if there's no myoepithelium, then it's papillary carcinoma. Now really briefly, let's just talk about a myoepithelium because it's very important to understand and conceptualize. So the myoepithelium, as you see in this image, is a physical barrier. And that barrier is located above the basement membrane and below the luminal epithelial cells. And this serves a lot of functions in the prevention of cancer because this is literally a physical barrier between those epithelial cells that proliferate and turn into cancer and between the underlying stroma. So if an intraductal papilloma were to theoretically break through the myoepithelium and then that myoepithelial layer is gone, that's why when you look at the image and see no myoepithelial cells, you're no longer dealing with intraductal papilloma. You're probably dealing with something more invasive. Now, the myoepithelial cells, in addition to just being a physical barrier, also have tumor suppressor qualities, so they can induce apoptosis, prevent angiogenesis, and literally induce, induce growth arrest in some of these cells that would otherwise go on to spread and become something more invasive than just intraductal papilloma. So bottom line here is that the myoepithelial cells or the myoepithelium as a whole have a net effect of a physical and a chemical tumor suppressor. So when we go back to this flow chart, it should make a little bit of sense why you're trying to figure out in the image or by description, is there a myoepithelium? If yes, then it's just, the papilloma is just introductal. It can't go anywhere because the myoepithelium is chilling underneath. But if there's no myoepithelium, then we're probably dealing with papillary carcinoma because unfortunately those proliferating cells have broken through. So this is a very high yield discussion, not only to get the answer correct when you're picking between these two breast pathologies, but also just generally speaking to understand the role and the function of myoepithelial cells. So going back to the slide that I started on, this is introductal papilloma. Now we need a mnemonic in order to, to understand and to memorize whether or not that myoepithelium is present and which disease that tells us we're dealing with. So for intraductal, I want you to think the myoepithelium is included, so it's still there. But for papillary, that myoepithelium is popped. So in papillary, it's gone, it's popped. In intraductal, it's included, it's still there. High yield, just memorize this mnemonic. This will take you very far. Now we need to talk about fibroadenomas. So fibroadenomas are the most common breast tumor in women who are younger than 35 years of age. Fibroadenomas are marble-like, non-painful, rubbery, mobile, benign tumors made up of stromal and glandular tissue. 
really the big thing to memorize here and where I think the test writer will go on USMLE and Comlex is to know that fiber adenomas are estrogen sensitive. So they actually have receptors on them that respond to hormones. And therefore, during pregnancy and during the menstrual cycle, these fiber adenomas will get bigger and have the potential to exhibit some local symptoms like irritation, uh, pain, etc. Generally speaking, though, they're not painful. And then likewise, since these are estrogen sensitive, these tend to shrink and really not be any issue whatsoever in postmenopausal women. So if you're taking your test, you've got a 15 to 35 year old woman and they describe a mass in the breast. It doesn't hurt. It has, you know, well-defined borders, that sort of thing. You want to think fibroadenoma. So again, only big thing to know here is that it's estrogen sensitive. So my mnemonic is that fibroadenomas are estrogen sensitive. If you know that mnemonic, you're going to get most of your questions on fibroadenomas correct. Now, the last major benign breast pathology we need to talk about are Philodes tumors. And to be honest, Philodes tumors can actually range from benign to malignant. Most of them are benign. Rarely, some of them can be malignant. These are fibroepithelial tumors. Again, they range from benign to malignant. Really, the big thing to know and where the test writer will go on USMLE or Comlex is to know that these have histopathological leaf-like projections into epithelial line stroma and dilated lumen. You can see the image at the bottom of this slide. It's pretty characteristic when you're looking at breast tissue that you see those leafy looking projections. These usually occur in 40 to 50 year old women. Perhaps knowing that age range can help you eliminate some answer choices. But for your Philodes tumors, you just want to remember those leaf-like projections. My mnemonic here is actually super simple and helpful. When you think leaf-like projections, I want you to think leaf-like, leaf-like for Philodes, leaf-like projections. You just need to know that buzzword because this is what's going to show up. Either that image is going to show up or that buzzword is showing up. If they don't give you any of those things, there's absolutely no way that you're going to get Philodes tumor correct on your USMLE or Comlex. So with the completion of the Philodes tumor, we've now gone through both inflammatory conditions and mostly benign conditions. We're now going to conclude this video by talking about the malignant breast pathologies. Truth be told, the malignant breast pathologies are not that difficult to memorize, and you'll see in just a second, but there's not a lot of buzzwords, there's not a lot of really high yield things that are associated with the malignant conditions. So for that reason, these are a little bit easier to learn. Um, although they're still difficult to memorize because they do sound quite similar. So let's get started with ductal carcinoma in situ. So in situ, just generally speaking, for those of you who like to understand language to understand what you're dealing with on tests, in situ means it's like in the original place. It hasn't left. So if it's ductal carcinoma in situ, yes, it's ductal carcinoma. Yes, it's technically malignant breast cancer, but it hasn't yet invaded the basement membrane. So generally speaking, when you see in situ, you know that Whatever carcinoma it's talking about, if it's that in situ, it's that not yet through the basement membrane. So ductal carcinoma in situ is proliferation of the cells within ducts, hence the name ductal carcinoma, but since it's in situ, has not yet invaded the basement membrane. And that's actually important to understand because if they give you an image and you're able to see the basement membrane in that image and see that there's no cells breaking through there and no growth that looks dysplastic or what have you beyond that, then you're in good shape. The The one thing that does pop up with ductal carcinoma in situ is the presence of calcifications in a lot of different arrangements. So I think you need to know that ductal carcinoma in situ has calcifications. So ductal carcinoma in situ for me is DCS. DCS has DEM calcifications. DCS, ductal carcinoma in situ, DCS, DEM calcifications. I don't know how to emphasize the S at the end of a word. That's so awkward hearing me do that out loud. Um, but that's it for ductal carcinoma in situ. So then we have invasive ductal carcinoma. And whenever you have invasive blank, you can think of the blank as being the in situ version, but now we've broken through the basement membrane. So invasive ductal carcinoma is basically, you can think of it as DCIS once we get through that basement membrane, and now the prognosis is obviously worse. So this has duct-like structures and a desmoplastic stroma. If you see that description, 
They're talking about invasive ductal carcinoma. Now, there are a few subtypes of invasive ductal carcinoma that you need to be familiar with or at least be able to recognize. The first big one, which is going to be the second image on the bottom of the slide, is medullary breast carcinoma. And medullary breast carcinoma can be described as a syncytial sheet-like growth with lymphocytic infiltrate. So you look at that second image, you see all those lymphocytes, you see the relative sheet-like growth that's going on. That's medullary breast carcinoma being somewhat of a subtype of invasive ductal carcinoma. The third um, image I want to show you and the highest yield subtype for exam purposes is inflammatory breast carcinoma. The reason that this is the highest yield subtype is because the image is the most unique and the description is the most unique. So this is going to be described as dermal lymphatic uh, invasion by tumor cells. And the way that it could present in the vignette and where I think the test writer will go is they're going to describe somebody with a unilateral painful swollen breast. And you're going to have to pick between invasive ductal carcinoma or spe more specifically inflammatory breast carcinoma. You're going to have to pick between that and mastitis because this is going to look a lot like acute mastitis. And the, the way that you're going to pick this is either by the image, which you see on the far right, and I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but that's known as pio de orange. I think that's French. Please excuse my butchering of the word. Um, so it's, it's described to look like the skin of an orange. Pule de orange. Am I saying that right? Someone let me know in the comment section. Um, if the breast looks like the skin of an orange, you're dealing with inflammatory breast carcinoma. And you're also going to look for the description, obviously. So if they talk about lymphatic invasion, um, specifically dermal lymphatic invasion, then you're dealing with inflammatory breast carcinoma and not necessarily dealing with acute mastitis. Recall, you know, we went through this conversation earlier in this video, if they want you to pick acute mastitis, they're going to give you someone that's breastfeeding or someone that didn't uh, get the milk out of their breast by pumping or by breastfeeding. So the risk factors are a little bit different as well. So that's inflammatory breast carcinoma. That third image is extremely high yield. Know what it is, what it's called in French. Hopefully you can say it correctly because I certainly can't. And know the description. So that's invasive ductal carcinoma. Now, just like DCIS and then invasive ductal carcinoma, we also have LCIS, lobular carcinoma in situ. So what is this? Well, it's lobular, so it's proliferation of lobular cells, and it's in situ, so it's not yet invaded the basement membrane. Funny how language works, huh, guys? Now, the big thing here is that this lacks E. cadherin, all right? So that's very high yield because E. cadherin as an adherent excuse me, as an adhesion protein is very important for preventing um, certain type of cellular derangement. So lobular carcinoma in situ, LCIS, really what you need to know is that it lacks E-cadherin. That's like singularly the only high yield fact that I need you to know. So because of that, you want to think that lobular carcinoma lacks cadherin, LC, LC. Lobular carcinoma lacks cadherin. Now, if LCIS were to theoretically break through that basement membrane, now you're dealing with invasive lobular carcinoma. All right, so I'm just trying to simplify this. This is basically LCIS through the basement membrane. And just like the in situ version, this lacks E. cadherin. And the way that this will be described to you, and this is the high yield point for invasive lobular carcinoma, is that it is non-cohesive cells organized in a single file pattern. And I'm sure that if you look at this image, you can appreciate that this looks very distinct from the other images of the breast cancers that you've seen. So that single file pattern of cellular organization is very unique to invasive lobular carcinoma. So we need a mnemonic to remember this. So when you think of invasive lobular carcinoma, I want you to think of ILC, ILC for individual line carcinoma, which reminds me of single file pattern individual line carcinoma for single file pattern. That's very important to understand because that image is pretty high yield. Great news, everybody. We're done. We've gone through the inflammatory conditions, the benign conditions, and the malignant conditions. Again, the emphasis of this video is not to teach you pathophysiology. The emphasis of this video is to teach you how to use clever mnemonics, tips, and tricks to conceptualize, to simplify, and to get extra points on USMLE and Comlex. So I hope that this was useful to you. If it was, please like and subscribe, share it with your buddies. Good luck. Keep it up.